Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is while you're watching this. I'm Perry Freeman. This is Cop Facts, Zebra 56 LLC. And this is uh, the third of our lesson plans. And this one is going to be titled Patrol Procedures. Again, uh, normally I would teach this in a classroom and it would probably be maybe four hours of lecture and then we would go out and do exercises. I'm going to try to condense this uh, to maybe less than 15 minutes. Hopefully I can hold your attention. And we're going to go over where you would be after you get out of the police academy. And that's what we're working on here is getting you to apply. Uh, you to get through the testing procedure, get hired by a police department, go through an academy, come out. Um, you're going to probably go through uh, a period of time where you're riding with a veteran officer or several officers. Uh, field training uh, takes place a lot of times. But eventually you end up on the street alone in a cruiser uh, as a patrol officer. So that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to give you just the basics so you have a feel for what your responsibilities would be as a patrol officer. So first of all, you have to realize that you as a patrol officer are the most important part of any police department or sheriff's department. A lot of other jobs like SWAT, narcotics, uh, evidence rooms, all the civilians that work for the department, all of the supporting people in any department are really there to do just that, to support the patrol bureau, the patrol officers. Usually a department's going to be broke up in um, patrol administration and investigations. And patrol uh, obviously is the biggest part of any police department. So, very important. Can't be taken lightly. Even though that's where you begin, it's very important. You are on the front line of um, just about everything that happens in law enforcement. You're the image of the department. You're the image of the community for people from outside of your town. So, very important that you act professionally. Hopefully you've had proper training. And your actions and your attitude as a patrol officer are very far reaching. Again, the image of your department depends on you and every contact that you have on the street. And there's gonna be many. I would say probably 75% of the sworn officers on any department are in patrol. So you're a huge portion. It's three quarters of your department is going to be in uniform in routine patrol every day. Now, that's a huge responsibility. In a rural, small community uh, where it's fairly slow, you may only get two, three, four calls on a shift. <clears throat> in a big city, you're going to get maybe 15, 20 calls a night or day shift, whatever your uh, shift might be. So you're going to be very busy. Um, you're going to be sent to those calls by uh, your dispatcher. <clears throat> and where I came from, um, the dispatcher had the authority of the chief of police. We were to respond to the dispatcher as if it were the police chief that was talking to us. Uh, I've seen other departments that uh, doesn't really work that way. I personally think that's the way it should work. But um, they're going to dispatch you to different situations. Now, obviously those situations could be anything from a barking dog, could be a neighborhood dispute, it could be um, a domestic hot domestic assault going on or disturbance, or it could be an active shooter situation or shots fired situation, man down situation. You never know what that call is going to be. 
<clears throat> so you have to be ready for just about anything. Now, um, your professionalism as you respond to those calls is so important. Historically, the patrol officer was in what we called a reactive stage. You waited for that call and you responded and, and took care of business. Today, we're much more proactive. In the past, the patrol officer was in what we called a reactive stage. You reacted to uh, the call that you were dispatched to. Not so much anymore. Today, we try to be more proactive. That's where community policing comes in, which is very important. Uh, you're going to be ex assigned to um, a zone or a sector uh, that you're responsible for. There might be a couple of officers assigned to that sector, or you may be there alone. But getting to know your community, getting to know the people in your community is very important. <clears throat> A crime does occur if you have done your job appropriately and got to know everybody, you may already have a clue who the perpetrator might be. You know, m preventing the crime is, is the goal. You're there to protect and serve. And if you can prevent crime from occurring, that's going to be great. You know, my grandfather had something he used to say. He used to say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I've reflected on that many times in police work, thinking, yeah, if we could have just prevented that, uh, we wouldn't have all this work to solve, to cure uh, the case. So um, community policing is very important. And uh, you want to get to know all the store owners. If you have convenience stores, those kind of things, you want to get to know all those people. And they'll give you information. Uh, the patrol officer has lots of information. They're a wealth of information. And a good patrol officer will pass that on to the appropriate detectives sometimes, maybe narcotics detectives or um, persons crimes detectives. Um, so keep that in mind. You're... Uh, you know, you're there on the front line again, like I said, and you're, you're obtaining a lot of information from these people, and you're going to react to it, hopefully appropriately. Now, a lot of people think that the um, SWAT teams, uh, the detectives, the narcs working undercover uh, have the most dangerous uh, work to do because they're glamorized so much in the movies and TV. I don't agree at all. Um, I worked undercover uh, quite a while. And the difference between, let's say, the SWAT team and a narcotics detective, we know who we're dealing with. When I was going in to buy dope from somebody, I had a pretty good idea who they were. I already had done research about their criminal record. I knew how violent they might be. A SWAT team, the same thing. Before they hit some building, uh, to make a, an arrest on some type of raid, they do a lot of research. They rehearse. They have a layout of the building. They know how many people they expect to be in there. They know what kind of equipment they're going to need. They know what they're going into. Same with the narcotics detective. Same with the detective going in to interview people. It's usually not a hot situation. The patrol officer is the first one on the scene. You never know what you're getting into. You're going to be dispatched to, like I said, anything from a dog barking uh, to an active shooting situation. And by the way, we've changed the approach that we have on things like active shooters. Years ago, on an active shooter situation, let's just say a school shooting, uh, God forbid, they would set up a command post, maybe a block or two away, and put a game plan together. Meanwhile, the shooter is taking care of business. Unfortunately, um, I won't go into where and when this happened, but um, a situation many years ago uh, that happened, and it was a um, situation where there were a bunch of young ladies who were molested and murdered while law enforcement set up on the hill and put a game plan together. 
We don't do that anymore. You, as the patrol officer, even if you're alone, you're going to go in immediately and stop that illegal activity, that dangerous activity. We've changed the way we approach those things. It's a, it's, it's a bad deal for that first cop, but you've got to do it. You've got to stop that shooter. Now, in a hostage situation, things might change. There's a lot of variables. But if you've got somebody actively injuring people, shooting people, harming people, you got to go in. We don't sit and put a meeting together anymore. That can take place too. But that first cop, those first few cops, are going in and confront the situation. So, back to my point, the patrol officer has the most dangerous job. You never know what you're being dispatched to. Every call is a, is a total surprise. You go in, you deal with it. Now, um, you have a lot of discretion being a patrol officer. Um, you're going to make a lot of traffic stops. Probably for the first few years, most of your contact with the public is going to be through traffic stops. And you never know what those are going to result in. Um, I had a good friend killed when I first went on the police department, just on a basic traffic stop. A guy came out with a sawed-off weapon, um, shot him almost point blank before he had a chance to react. So I learned right away how dangerous a traffic stop can be. Um, I won't mention his name right now, but there's a street named after him in Colorado Springs today. It's a sad day and a scary day. I was pretty new and had to kind of rethink, do I really want to do this? Well, I did it for a long time, so I guess I, I made the right decision. I got through it so far. <clears throat> so you have a lot of discretion. So when you have these contacts, maybe traffic stops, whatever, or maybe minor criminal activity, you have a decision whether you just do a report and turn it over maybe to the prosecutor to make that decision, or do you uh, just go with a verbal warning to this person, or do you cite them and put them into court, or do you physically have to arrest these people uh, on a more serious crime? So there's a lot of discretion involved, and you have to make a lot of quick decisions, uh, and hopefully you make the right decisions, because as we've talked before, you're going to be questioned. Uh, everybody questions what you do, and uh, that's just part of the job, as, as I've mentioned several times. So let's, let's kind of talk about what your responsibilities are going to be um, when you get that dispatch call, regardless of what it is. <clears throat> your first duty is to get there safely, to drive your cruiser and get to the location safely. It may not be a hot Code 3 situation. But you still have to get there safely. You got to make observations. Uh, you got to be listening to the radio, maybe talking on the radio at the same time you're driving. Uh, you have a lot going on. So getting there safely without having an accident is your first priority. Now, as you get closer to the scene, depending on what the crime or the call might be about, you want to make observations of who's leaving, what vehicles are leaving. And if you can get tag numbers, great. A lot of times you can just rattle those numbers off to dispatch and then they're recorded. <clears throat> because if there is a crime, that just might be your suspect that's driving out of the area. Just something to think about. Form that habit from the get-go. Now, when you arrive at the scene, I think your next responsibility would be um, caring for the injured. If someone's injured, obviously you need to care for the injured. Call EMTs if you need them. Call reinforcements if you need more people. Um, that's critical. Um, <clears throat> you have to protect the scene if you've got a crime. And using a camera, you may have a body camera on, that's great, but you may be wanting to use your cell phone or another camera and taking as many pictures as you can. Pictures worth a thousand words, I'm sure you've heard that. Um, I've taken thousands of pictures. Um, when I went from a larger department to a small department, I kind of shocked the people uh, in the smaller department with how often I was taking pictures of everything as I would get out of my car. And hopefully a lot of those people picked up that habit because that's recorded then. 
and things get moved and the contamination of evidence is critical so photographing things uh, is very important you can be talking to people interviewing the reporting party interviewing other people uh, to learn what happened and all that but you're still making observations because um, maybe the perpetrator is still in the area watching to see what you're doing to see who's talking to the cops that kind of thing <clears throat> so a lot going on uh, if it's a um, crime and it's a kind of a hot situation kind of an active situation let's say so you are observing everything around you you're observing uh, all the items around you and eventually uh, you're probably going to be collecting some of those items and we're going to have a, a class on the collection and preservation of evidence um, that's very important uh, you can't contaminate any of it um, obvious statement but um, we'll cover that in another uh, class. So you're going to be interviewing people, and something I want to point out, and I've seen this happen over and over and over, a patrol officer would go and interview a number of people, kind of get an uh, overview of what was going on or what had happened, and then myself or other detectives would arrive later, and the patrol officer would say, yeah, this gal that was wearing a red dress told me this and this and that, which was important information. But they didn't get a full name, a date of birth, a phone number, and an address for that person so we can recontact them. That's a huge problem. Um, and in the excitement, it does happen. Get in the habit of asking those questions and getting that jotted down right away. <clears throat> A lot of people use a recorder. Uh, you can record stuff as you're talking to people. I'm talking to Bill Smith here. He's a white male. Uh, Mr. Smith, how old are you? What's your date of birth? Where do you live? And you've got that recorded. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, patrol officers use that technique. Some people will tell you to, what to do with that recorder, but that's, um, that's none of their business. So, in a nutshell, that's kind of what you're going to be faced with those first few years on a law enforcement uh, agency. Um, keep in mind that that image is critical. And who is really your boss? It's the citizens, the people that pay the taxes, the people that you're dealing with, that you're protecting, that you're serving, that you're talking to. Those are actually your boss. Keep that in mind. So when they complain to your supervisor, supervisors listen. Um, something to put in the back of your head. All right. Um, the patrol division of any department is the backbone of law enforcement. Like I said, at least 75% of every agency is uniform patrol out doing routine um, shifts. So. It's the beginning of police work, but it's the most important part, really, I think. And as I've mentioned before in, in, in the investigation, um, basic investigation class, so often information obtained by that first officer is what solved the crime. So that'll be it for today. Um, some people spend their whole career in patrol. Some guys just love it. They don't ever want to put on a suit or go undercover or work on a SWAT team or any of that stuff. They like patrol and some people stay there their whole career. That's great. We need those kind of people. Uh, others want to move into other areas uh, and that's fine too. So I guess that'll be it. This is patrol procedures. Hope you learned a little bit about what that's going to be like. Um, I'm Perry Freeman. This is Cop Facts. Zebra 56 LLC is my company. And I hope to see you on the next lesson, which will be coming up soon. Be safe. Hope to see you soon.